All right, if I can ask everyone to fill their plates and find a seat, we're going to get started here very shortly. Welcome to Tiller House. My name is Elizabeth Anderson, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Society of International Law, and it's a real pleasure to have you here uh, with us today. Uh, those of you who are not so familiar with the Society, um, we've been around for 103 years, and we have a mission of promoting greater understanding and use of international law. The Society does not take positions generally on policy issues, but rather conceives of itself as a uh, a resource, an educational forum, a convener of those interested in international law. And we uh, try to inform discussion of international law through our publications, our conferences, events such as this. We cover the full range of international law in our activities and in our publications, private international law, public international law, international legal practice. And one of the areas in which we have um, been convening, uh, I would say, a growing number of programs is in the growing area of law and development. And that is the, the area in which our, we convene today's meeting. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome two uh, old friends and uh, valued colleagues, Robert Lockery and Andrew Solomon, um, to address you today on the critical questions of developing the rule of law in Afghanistan. Our principal speaker is Robert Lockery, who returned just over the weekend from um, his post as section leader in the Afghanistan Justice Sector Support Program, um, which is a U.S. government, U.S. State Department funded rule of law project in Afghanistan. And he will describe uh, to us the work that they have been doing, uh, the challenges that he sees in promoting the rule of law in Afghanistan, which is, of course, a great a high priority for the Obama administration. Rob uh, came to this work um, with considerable experience in the international rule of law field. I worked with him most closely uh, when he was serving as the regional director for uh, the rule of law programs run by the American Bar Association, formerly known as SEALI. And also, um, while there, he uh, served as, um, uh, also as country director for the Serbia program. So uh, and previously he had um, experience as a prosecutor in Colorado. And uh, he thought Serbia was challenging, and then he went to Kabul. Uh, commenting on, on Robert's presentation will be Andrew Solomon, who is deputy director of the Brookings Burn Project on Internal Displacement and a fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. He formerly served as program director here at ASIL, and as a co-director of the Rule of Law Research Office at ABA Seely. So without uh, further introduction, please um, join me in welcoming our speakers, and I think Andrew will begin with some uh, initial framing comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Betsy. It's a pleasure to be back uh, at ASIL. And, uh, I'm really going to do more facilitation than commenting today, uh, but I do appreciate the uh, opportunity and, and the invitation uh, to uh, participate in this uh, discussion on the uh, rule of law, uh, promotion of the rule of law uh, following military intervention in uh, Afghanistan, uh, where we can see legal and judicial system uh, reform uh, at least being attempted uh, in the context or larger context of reconstruction and stabilization and also uh, alongside uh, counterinsurgency uh, operations. I think it's fair uh, to assert that rule of law promotion is highly complex and uh, quite difficult, even under optimal conditions, uh, where we have peace and security uh, in addition to a, a functioning government that's able to exercise some semblance of sovereignty over the population and territory that it purports to uh, represent, uh, uh, in addition to some domestic uh, capacity and expertise, uh, uh, as well as local ownership and local attitudes, which uh, can give rise to and ultimately sustain over a longer term uh, rule of law uh, and legal reform. 
Now, unfortunately, uh, I think as everybody in this uh, room knows, uh, the conditions in Afghanistan are anything but optimal. Uh, and in recent, uh, uh, recently we're seeing uh, a, a rise in so-called kinetic activities, a resurgence of uh, the Taliban, uh, which is uh, attempting to assert control, if not influence, uh, in areas around the country, including uh, reinstituting its own form of uh, law uh, and justice. In addition, uh, poppy production and trafficking remains an economic mainstay. Uh, corruption is endemic. Public perception of the legitimacy and the, the relevancy and the effectiveness of the government in Kabul uh, remains low. And, and many people around the country are seeking uh, or looking to or prefer uh, customary law and informal justice systems as a way of uh, realizing their rights and resolving disputes. Uh, I would add to the mix uh, the uh, increasing frustration with the international presence uh, on the ground, which could be related perhaps uh, to the rise in civilian uh, casualties, uh, which leads to this perception that the international community is perhaps uh, above or outside uh, the law. And all of this, I think, complicates uh, and challenges those who are involved in so-called rule of law interventions or, or uh, who are seeking to promote uh, the rule of law. And I think these are things that we have to keep in mind as we think towards the future. Several months ago, the Obama administration, in announcing its so-called AFPAC uh, strategy, which was a newly energized approach to peace and security in the region, uh, emphasized the importance uh, and the significant role that governance, uh, including judicial reform and, and rule of law, uh, plays in that strategy and in reconstruction and, and stabilization efforts. Um, it's... Uh, it included in this um, uh, strategy a commitment to increasing diplomatic uh, resources, much needed financial resources, and also a boost to the uh, civilian expertise, which is planned uh, to deploy in parallel to the uh, American military personnel uh, and then work uh, in conjunction with their Afghan counterparts as well as the military on governance issues. Just last week, I was at a meeting uh, with a regional uh, uh, commander, a U.S. Uh, regional commander in uh, Afghanistan, and he was quite un unequivocal uh, and clear uh, in stating that, uh, quote, getting the governance, including rule of law, right, is one of the critical paths to success in Afghanistan. And he went on to say that uh, after uh, military forces go in and, and secure uh, the uh, the area and the population, and in his words, bleeding to do so, or bleeding in the process, uh, that there is an imperative need uh, for civilian expertise to follow uh, quickly uh, and to begin working on governance and rule of law issues. So I think we're seeing that uh, rule of law and governance is figuring more prominently uh, in the thinking uh, and now also in the policies. Um, I think that uh, those who are uh, involved in, in making the decisions are uh, perhaps uh, uh, paying attention to this book. I just want to, uh, uh, I think, recommend Can Might Make Rights, uh, Building the Rule of Law After Military invent, uh, Interventions. Uh, the authors, which include Jane, Jane Strom, Seth, uh, recommend or, or provide uh, guidance that military interventions really, you know, do ultimately need to rebuild the rule of law in post-conflict environments uh, in order to achieve that the original goals that they set out to achieve um, uh, for the, with the intervention. Uh, before turning it over to Rob, and this is really uh, his, um, his show today, uh, I would just uh, identify a couple uh, things to think about for, uh, in terms of rule of law interventions. Uh, planning and coordination are, are obviously uh, critical to the success of any uh, promotion or rule of law promotion um, uh, or initiative. Uh, interveners, rule of law promoters, uh, should really be thinking of rule of law in a holistic sense uh, and how the institutions of governance uh, ultimately link together. And then when building strategies and blueprints uh, for uh, rule of law, I think they need to think in terms of ends, ends being um, things like justice uh, and equality and social harmony, uh, and not just on the formal legal institutions, which tend 
um, to really, I think, uh, be a large part of, of these strategies. So getting that rule of law culture right, I, I think, is an important um, aspect of rule of law promotion, one that complements and ultimately, I think, allows these rule of law institutions uh, like courts, police, um, and um, other institutions to fun function effectively. Uh, and I think uh, rule of law promoters need to think creatively on how to do this uh, through education, advocacy, grassroots action, and also working, uh, responding to the uh, conditions that they, uh, they find themselves in and working where they exist uh, with informal and traditional uh, uh, structures. So I think with these things said and, and in mind, uh, I'll turn it over to Rob, uh, who will perhaps drill down into some of them uh, in his presentation. Uh, as Betsy mentioned, he's been uh, in Afghanistan and has a wealth of experience uh, around the world. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. After Rob completes his uh, presentation, uh, he and I will uh, – I'll just pose several questions for him for a brief response, uh, sort of a facilitated discussion, and then we'll open it up for a more interactive Q&A with all of you. Uh, before I start, uh, first a disclaimer. Um, I did work for uh, a, a contractor that was on contract with the State Department INL, uh, but I do not speak for INL here today, nor do I speak for the U.S. government. Um, I speak as a private citizen based on my experiences there working for the Justice Sector Support Program that was um, uh, formed by a company, a contractor called PAE, that had a contract with state INL to, to do legal reform work in Afghanistan. I think the announcement said I was in Afghanistan for two years. I was actually only there for one year, uh, although I had a friend that joked that years in Afghanistan were like dog years. So um, one year in the solar calendar, but seven dog years. I was down in the weeds. Uh, I was an implementer. Uh, I didn't get uh, a, a bird's eye view of what was going on there, nor did I deal with policy. I implemented it. Um, we, I was section leader for the Afghan um, Justice Sector Support Project, um, and in one, the, the JSSP, Justice Sector Support Project, was broken down into four parts. The biggest part was the work with the Afghan Attorney General's Office, or the AGO, and I was the leader of that component of the JSSP project. I worked with 10 Afghan attorneys, and I worked with uh, four Americans, three of whom were lawyers, one of whom was an Afghan-American who was a computer engineer. My job was twofold. It was, number one, to act as a U.S. advisor to the Attorney General of Afghanistan, advise him on embassy priorities, um, advise him on reform projects. The other uh, broad goal um, that I was charged with carrying out was implementing certain targeted rule of law um, project, reform projects within the Attorney General's Office of Afghanistan. Uh, those included, number one, forming an anti-corruption unit, an elite anti-corruption unit within the Attorney General's Office of Afghanistan to prosecute mid-level to high-level corruption cases. Uh, by the time I left last week, we had uh, formed that unit. It was 15 core, actually 13 four core prosecutors three administrative uh, assistants. Uh, we had office space for them. We had computers for them. They were busy investigating cases and had uh, made 14 arrests on what I would consider a high-level corruption case out in the provinces. Um, however, when I left, I think it's an indication of, of the success of this unit, there had been political interference from high up in the Afghan uh, government that caused those 14 people that were arrested in the corruption case to be released, and I, I expect that that uh, will happen over and over again as this unit grows and starts to make progress. Uh, one of the other um, specific reform projects that uh, we carried out in the Attorney General's Office of Afghanistan was a case management system. Uh, this case management system cut across all the uh, rule of law, uh, the, the justice sector, sector institutions in Afghanistan, from the police at the Ministry of the Interior to the Attorney General's Office to courts and on to corrections under the auspices of the Ministry of Justice. The uh, case management system uh, project was, could be broken down into two parts. It was paper-based, number one, 
uh, we um, were able to print up and distribute file folders that held documents. Afghanistan, the formal justice system in Afghanistan is civil law based, so documents are very important. Um, we printed up uh, case file folders for them uh, with pre-printed um, spaces to enter critical information that ensured that the cases would comply with the provisions of the Interim Criminal Procedure Code. Uh, we also, there was an electronic database associated with it. Um, and the way we went at that project was we started at the end. We started at the prisons. And uh, Polacharki Prison is located in Kabul. It's the central prison for Afghanistan. There are 4,000 inmates in Polacharki right now. We uh, are just about finished going through all the case files of inmates in Polacharki. 100% uh, of those case files were incomplete. Um, so part of our job was to run down the information and try to get basic critical information such as sentencing dates, crimes that people were convicted of. Um, and then we would upload, complete the files and then upload all that data into a database so that um, cases can be monitored and tracked as they go through the system and it will be harder for police, prosecutors, judges or prison officials to make cases go away um, through taking bribes and, and corruption. A third project we worked on was reform, um, just institutional reform of the Attorney General's office in terms of um, an organizational chart that was rational and made sense given the, the duties of the Attorney General and um, also writing clear job descriptions. Um, in fact, just writing job descriptions. There really weren't any when, when we arrived. Um, compiling um, transparent and fair hiring practices, promotion practices, uh, firing practices, disciplinary procedures. The, uh, this particular project, this third project I'm mentioning, it's called Priority Reform and Restructuring. It's, it's implemented through a presidential decree. And um, there was, as you might imagine, lots of resistance to this project throughout the government of Afghanistan because it meant that people couldn't just hire their cronies anymore, ministers or uh, people that were steps below the, the ministers uh, in the management of the different ministries in Afghanistan. Um, so this has been a difficult project to implement. Uh, the payoff, however, was the international community ponied up a, a pool of money and um, the uh, deal was made with the Afghan justice institutions that if they did this structural reform, the result would be an increase in salaries for uh, all the people that are um, in the ministries. And so actually that, that did work somewhat as, as leverage. Um, and uh, although I have some concerns about that project given the state it was in when I left. We did some other things too. We, we um, did some legislative drafting. We worked, uh, we were co-secretaried along with UNODC uh, on a group, a working group that drafted legislation for the MOJ. Uh, when I left, we had completed um, revisions to almost all the draft articles for the new Criminal Procedure Code of Afghanistan and submitted those to the Ministry of Justice for their review. Um, some of you may know there's an interim Criminal Procedure Code right now in Afghanistan. It has lots of problems. It was written by an Italian jurist and um, it took effect in 2004. Among the problems are unrealistic time frames to get things done, to move cases through the process. Uh, it assumes a level of, uh, of capacity, human capacity, that doesn't exist in Afghanistan. There's also a provision that says that um, pre-existing laws, and, um, and that probably means from the period of 64 to 73, which is sort of the golden age of, of rule of law in Afghanistan, pre -exist, those pre-existing codes um, that are, were in effect um, in 2004, um, are, as long as they don't contradict with the Interim Criminal Procedure Code, are still in effect. And so you've got an interim criminal procedure code that's flawed layered on top of uh, a pre-existing criminal code and criminal procedure code. And I think it would be tough for um, any – I was a prosecutor for 10 years. I think it would be tough for me to try to make sense of that hodgepodge of laws. So we were trying to fix that situation too. Uh, so – when I talk about rule of law, of course, we all know it's a flexible concept. Rule of law, everybody has their definition. You, Paul, uh, the EU has one. Um, USAID has one. The UN has one. 
Um, for purposes of my discussion, uh, it means the criminal justice system as viewed through the lens of working um, with prosecutors in the Attorney General's Office of Afghanistan. One of the other, I suppose, caveats um, that I need to mention is due to the security situation, we didn't have the, the freedom of movement that I did when I worked in Serbia or Bulgaria um, or other places in Central Asia or even I did some work in Africa, uh, even in Africa. Um, whenever I went out, we, we lived in a guarded compound in Kabul. Whenever I went out, I wore body armor and I had at least two shooters with me with AK-47s. And so um, going to, to meetings with Afghans um, who are out there and in danger um, every day of their lives without that level of support, um, it, was, it was a barrier in several different ways to getting to know Afghans, working with them, forming trust and, and relationships so that we could carry out um, reform. The last thing I should mention um, just in my introduction is legal pluralism is alive and well in Afghanistan. Um, legal pluralism, as I understand the definition, refers to um, different sources of the law. And in Afghanistan, uh, the sources of the law, I think, can be broken down broadly into, uh, into three parts. First is the formal system, um, the constitution and the statutes um, as uh, implemented through the formal justice system. Uh, the next is the informal system, tribal codes uh, like Pashtun Wali, um, if you're talking about the, the Pashtuns, that are implemented through jirgas, tribal jirgas and shuras or elders or mullahs. And the third uh, source of law in Afghanistan is Sharia. Um, and Sharia is interesting. It's, it's existed long before the, the formal system. Uh, and it um, is implemented through the formal system and it is also implemented through the uh, informal system. So it sort of crosses, um, uh, straddles the, the formal and the informal system. My experience was with the formal system. Um, although I was aware of the informal system, I had to be to, to, uh, to do my job. I did not work directly with the informal system, and I am no way an expert in it. Um, so um, my ability to comment on the informal system is somewhat limited. With all those caveats, um, I thought I'd first kind of give an overview of the formal system, and I thought maybe given the time constraints, the best way to do that would be to um, look at um, the, uh, the individual institutions um, in the criminal justice system. The bond agreement, bond agreement of, of 2001 um, ensured that the 1964 Constitution would be used as a basis for the present Constitution um, that's in place in Afghanistan. Um, it's, it's sometimes referred to as the 2004 Constitution. Generally, that's a good thing. Um, the 1964 Constitution, when it was passed, was considered one of the most enlightened and progressive in the Islamic world. It was based on, I think, uh, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian Constitution and the Turkish Constitution. Um, it, does rec it did recognize uh, Sharia law. Um, and as does the 2004 Constitution. Um, it also, however, recognized equal rights for women, as does the 2004 Constitution. Article 7 of the 2004 Constitution states that the state of Afghanistan must observe the UN Charter and other international treaties, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, Article 22 establishes equal rights for men and women. Uh, Article 27 is interesting when we, when you think about this, a concept that's pretty hot right now in Afghanistan, and I'm not sure if people here are talking about it, um, but this idea of linking the formal system with the informal system to try to um, uh, increase credibility for the formal system and increase supervision regarding human rights and, um, and, and abuses um, of, of those rights, especially in regard to women for the informal system. Article 27 says that no person may be punished without a decision of an authoritative court in accordance with provisions of, of law that were promulgated prior to the criminal act being carried out. Article 31 um, of the Constitution uh, gives the accused and suspects the right to an attorney. Article 2 of the Constitution lists the official religion of Afghanistan as Islam. And Article 3 is, has created some confusion 
Um, it states, it provides that no law shall contravene the tenets and provisions of the holy religion of Islam. Another article of the Constitution that's important in understanding um, the delegation of powers to different rule of law institutions is Article 134. Article 134 um, defines the role of police as only detecting crime. They uh, are to discover crime, they are to detect it, and that's all. Um, criminal investigations are done by the, the, the prosecution office or the Sarin Wall. Um, the prosecutors, the Sarin Wall, not only investigate crimes, but they also decide whether an indictment should be filed, and if so, they pursue the indictment in the different court levels. Um, this means that the police are um, largely relegated to doing two things, manning checkpoints um, and acting as a paramilitary organization and uh, detecting crime and passing it on to prosecutors. Statistics on fatalities for the, the Afghan National Police, the ANP, show that they're at least two or three times higher uh, than the ANA, the Afghan National Army. Um, I think that's because they are, um, number one, used as a paramilitary. They're not in practice really much of a rule of law institution. Um, they're also out there. They're very visible. They're out on the street. They're in uniform. Um, they're manning checkpoints. They're, they're, they're very poorly trained and they're also extremely corrupt. Afghans, in general, despise the police. And so the Taliban find them an easy target, a soft target, um, and they often get kudos for attacking the police and public support for doing that. And uh, I think something like, maybe you all have better numbers than I do, but something like 1,700 uh, ANP members were killed last year in insurgent attacks. Uh, prosecutors, the flip side of this is prosecutors have uh, a wide scope of powers. Um, there is no, like in a lot of civil law countries, there'll be an investigating magistrate that's part of the judiciary that does the investigation and hands it on to the judge. In um, Afghanistan, it's the prosecutors that, uh, that do that. The uh, prosecutors are uh, set up and organized according to a 1991 law that's fairly archaic. And one of the provisions is Article 22 of that law um, plants prosecutors within other government ministries. And I think the idea back in 1991 was these, they're called monitoring prosecutors. These pros prosecutors would monitor the different government ministries. And if they found um, people that were not carrying out the decrees of the government, um, then they were to take action against uh, the other ministries in that regard. The way it works now is that uh, prosecutors from the Attorney General's office are embedded into the different government ministries. Um, however, very few formal cases result. Um, if they discover some malfeasance, usually corruption, those cases, um, uh, that our evidence suggests, are dealt with informally, um, often through um, bribes to the monitoring prosecutors. But it does give the Attorney General tremendous power um, if he chooses to use it against his peers, against the other ministries in the executive branch. Uh, as I said, um, in theory, everybody has a constitutional right to an attorney. And if you cannot, if an Afghan who is detained does not, is indigent, uh, the state must provide an attorney uh, to him or her. In reality, uh, we have a, a very small defense bar in Afghanistan. There are 360 attorneys that are represented um, within the Afghan Bar Association that are registered there. Um, there are 32.7 million citizens um, in Afghanistan. So that ratio, 360 attorneys to 32.7 million, um, it, uh, it means that most people go unrepresented. Uh, it's compounded by the fact that most of these 360 attorneys are located in Kabul. Um, we tried to figure out how many attorneys were located out in the provinces. We were able to count um, 21 legal aid attorneys out in the provinces. Uh, there are some NGOs providing um, some legal assistance. They're under-resourced. They're understaffed. The uh, MOJ uh, started a legal aid program. They've got 16 lawyers, and my colleagues within JSSP were working with them 
these 16 lawyers, obviously, they're, they're all in Kabul, and they're not enough to, to deal with the massive number of cases that are, that are going through the system. Um, there, we also have a problem, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, just with human capacity and uh, defense attorneys being able to um, come up with credible defenses, articulate them, go up against prosecutors, take on judges. Uh, they're pretty reluctant to do that. The final criminal justice uh, institution is the MOJ. They um, have under their auspices the, uh, the prisons, the CPD, Central Prisons Directorate. The CPD um, or prisons used to be under the MOI, the Ministry of the Interior, and uh, it's uh, uh, basically a police force and also fairly uh, militaristic. Um, in 2003, it was moved over to the Minister of Justice, which is a very civilian organization. It's been a pretty uncomfortable fit. MOJ has gone through this PRR process that I described earlier. Uh, so there uh, were rational um, organizational, a rational organizational chart was uh, imposed on the MOJ. Salary increases resulted. However, um, they weren't sure quite what to do with the CPD, and so it has not been reformed under this PRR process. It's the largest department of the MOJ. Um, prison growth is expanding rapidly. In um, 2004, there were 4,000 prisoners in Afghanistan. In 2008, there were 12,000, and there are 14,000 now. I think that has to do with more cases um, going into the formal justice system as um, some of our efforts start to pay off with that system. Sorry, actually, the last, uh, the last uh, uh, institution is the courts. We didn't work much with the courts. USAID had a rule of law project that dealt solely with the courts. Um, there is, the Constitution does provide uh, judicial review for the courts. Uh, the trials are to be open. They're open to the public, at least in theory anyway. Um, in reality, they're actually not. The courthouses and the facilities are often just um, mud buildings, um, the interim criminal procedure code requires five days' notice uh, before there's any kind of a hearing. In fact, that five-day notice uh, provision is almost never complied with, and judges end up reviewing cases and holding hearings with nobody in the courtroom. Uh, it'll be them, an incomplete file, and they'll make a determination based on that incomplete file. Um, the um, One of the uh, interesting Articles of the Constitution is um, it, it mandates a method of analysis for judges. Article 130 says that courts must first apply the provisions of the Constitution and other laws. If no provision of the Constitution or other laws exist, the courts may use Hanafi jurisprudence to obtain justice, and that's a Sunni school of jurisprudence. So here you, you see the legal pluralism where you've got judges in the formal system um, that are told that if uh, the formal laws uh, don't remedy the situation, they're to turn to Sharia to do this. Let's see. Where's Nasser? I may need some help getting my next one up. Um, while Nestor's doing that, I, um, I thought it would be good to, after I went over the, the formal system and the justice institutions, to place them in context. And um, to do that, thank you, I uh, used the Brookings Afghanistan Index. Um, this index, I used it for two reasons. Number one, it's relatively new. Uh, statistics are really hard to get in Afghanistan. Numbers are hard to get. And um, this one came out in January, on January 21st, 2009, and it had um, what I thought was it painted a pretty good picture um, of the general situation in Afghanistan, although I do have some concerns about some of the numbers. I thought in general it painted a better, a rosier picture of Afghanistan and um, the situation there than what at least I experienced. 
I think the, the toughest problem that we had in trying to reform the Attorney General's office and, and my colleagues had in trying to uh, establish rule of law through other um, reforming other institutions was uh, the lack of, of education on the part of our counterparts. Um, these numbers, I think, uh, maybe are a little high. Um, what I've seen is uh, 12% literacy rate for females and, and lower for males as well, uh, but you get the idea. Um, I think nothing impacted our work quite as much as the fact that many of our counterparts um, in the Attorney General's office or if it was USCID working with judges couldn't read or write. Um, it also affected uh, their ability to think critically or to problem solve. An example, when I went to go talk to the Attorney General um, about setting up an anti-corruption unit, I pitched it to him as, look, let's start small. Let's start with 10 to 15 prosecutors. Um, they'll start taking some cases in, learn how to work with the police a little bit better than they have been in the past, uh, learn how to use investigative equipment, um, and we'll start to build cases and we'll build capacity. Then we'll gradually expand. He and all his deputy attorney generals ha were going to have none of it. They wanted 450 prosecutors assigned right away to the unit and, and wanted them to start working. Um, well, the international community, we had uh, probably 10 mentors that we could have, uh, um, that we could have, that, that we were able to devote to this. And so it just wasn't feasible. And yet we just went round and round. In every meeting I had with the Attorney General, we would fight about this. It, it also manifested itself in um, dealing with budgets, um, dealing with finance, um, dealing with uh, terms of reference. World Bank is administering a really big uh, rule of law project there that's in support of the national justice sector strategy. And um, they've got a big pot of money that donor nations have supplied through the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund. To get at the money, the uh, Afghan uh, justice institutions need to file terms of reference or proposals um, saying, here's what we want to do. We want to build a new headquarters for the Attorney General's office. Um, the Attorney General's office headquarters right now is are some um, mud buildings. They've got uh, no sniper screens on top. There's, there's no razor wire on top of, of, of the walls. Um, there are, they just now put some bollards out front. There's a flimsy metal gate, and um, you may remember February 11th, the attacks on the Ministry of Justice there. It was really easy for the Taliban just to run a VBIED uh, up in, through the gates, blow the gates, um, some people on foot follow, walk inside, and, and kill people inside. Um, so security is needed, um, a new building is needed but for the, for the Attorney General, but to, it was almost impossible to sit with the Attorney General and his staff and try to come up with priorities, uh, to come up with um, a budget um, to submit, um, to come up with work plans and things like that. And in reality, what happens is internationals then start just writing them for these institutions. We just start doing it, and so there's no buy-in from the Afghan side or very little. Uh, one of the other ways that um, lack of education, lack of literacy impacted our work there um, was the um, government employees as well as citizens um, didn't recognize formal authority as um, it was laid out in the formal system. Um, the, the Afghan Attorney General has certain enumerated powers, um, certain things he gets to do and he doesn't get to do um, according to the law. That holds true for the Minister of Justice. It holds true for the Minister of the Interior. Um, however, m many of the employees, for example, the Minister, Ministry of the Interior, can't read or write. So when they're given an order by their boss, there's no way for them to say, well, wait a minute, is that even legal? You don't have the authority to do that. And in Afghanistan, the way it works is um, ministers end up having um, ultimate authority over their ministries. They can hire, they can fire, they do whatever they want, and, and, and they are followed unquestioningly by the people underneath them. Uh, one of the third examples of how this, uh, a third example of how this impacted our work uh, was something I, I talked about earlier. Afghanistan, the formal system is civil law based, and so documents are very important. However, so many of these people, when a case goes from the police to the prosecutors to the judges uh, to corrections, can't read or write. So you can't document important things like what were they arrested for, when were they arrested, so you can determine detention times and when people should be released. Um, 
charges, um, when the sentence is up, things like that. Um, what, as I said, 100% of 3,000 case files that we reviewed were incomplete and lacking critical information. Poverty was also an issue. Um, in, uh, in this slide, we see that poverty is described as uh, living on a monthly income of $14 a month or less. Um, by that standard, 42% of people in Afghanistan live below the poverty line. Um, if you combine that with, the, with this one right here, the next one, 20% uh, live slightly above. You've got a majority of, of Afghans who live below the poverty line or slightly above. Um, this impacts um, rule of law uh, in many ways. You've got an Ill money is power. So you've got an illiterate society um, who don't know what their basic rights are, don't have access to an attorney, are very poor, and so completely um, at the whim of uh, what could be often a predatory system of, of, of justice in Afghanistan. Um, and the next slide shows the... Uh, the percent of the population experiencing food poverty, I thought that was worth noting because um, we all know there's a link between cognitive development and malnutrition, and I think that does not bode well for the future and people, um, people's ability in Afghanistan to, to build um, a fair, transparent, just um, rule of law system. Uh, you're probably all aware of Transparency International's annual corruption perception survey. Corruption, when, when Afghans are polled, they consistently list their, um, among their biggest problems as first security, and then usually the next problem they see is corruption. Uh, corruption is endemic in Afghanistan. Um, part of this is due to the fact that salaries aren't very high. Um, we estimated that for a family of four to live in Kabul, it probably would cost $300 a month. Yet the average uh, salary for a prosecutor right now is $87 a month. Um, add on to that the fact that in Afghanistan, people have big families, and um, you've got justification for corruption right there. Police get paid a little less than $87 a month. Uh, judges a little bit more. Um, we, in doing our case management system, we had to survey uh, different prosecutors throughout Afghanistan. And um, part of the goal of the case management system was to try to uh, give some transparency to the case flow process. Um, so we asked questions to prosecutors anonymously um, about corruption. And they were unanimous that the majority of prosecutors in Afghanistan are corrupt. Um, most of them, when we asked them to give a percentage, most of them said 99% of prosecutors are corrupt. When we did, uh, when we tried to set up our, when, when we were setting up our anti-corruption unit, one of the things we did to vet the prosecutors was to administer polygraph examinations. Um, now, we could probably debate all day about whether a polygraph examination number one is, is valid. Um, they're not acceptable in U.S. courts. Um, and then the other issue of uh, do they also, if, if you're using a translator in asking questions, um, whether that makes them less valid, it, it may. Um, but our results um, of those polygraph examinations showed that three out of four prosecutors um, uh, took bribes. So it's not quite 99 percent, but it's still a pretty high level. Um, a lot, by the way, a lot of people, a lot of the prosecutors failed the polygraph examination, not because they uh, failed to, not because they said they didn't take any bribes and the instrument showed they lied about it, but because they said they did take bribes and then apparently lied about the amount or the number of times um, that they took bribes. Um, the way they characterize bribes are gifts uh, for resolving cases. Um, the um, Prosecutors we talked to when we polled them informally said that they probably only receive about 10% of the cases that the police detect and that the other 90% of cases that probably should be going from police to prosecutors and then on to uh, the courts um, are dealt with um, by the police either because they're paid a bribe or because the police um, feel like they're not getting paid enough money to deal with it and so they just don't. They just... Um, um, don't pursue the case and pass it on to the prosecutors. 
bribes, again, are, 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 our querying of the prosecutors shows that bribes are, are fairly high, surprisingly high. Um, prosecutors told us between $1,000 and $10,000 to get rid of a case, which I was pretty surprised at. Um, it, corruption manifests itself in, in, um, in the Ministry of the Interior and the police um, in a way that um, it, it structurally impacts um, that organization because commanders, police commanders out in the field have to rent their offices so that every month um, many um, police commanders owe a payment to their commander to keep their jobs, and if they can't make that payment, then they're replaced by somebody who can. Um, they, in turn, um, tell their subordinates that they have to pay uh, the, the commander so that he can pay on up the chain. And, of course, if you keep going down, at the bottom are the Afghan citizens who are being shaken down by the police and have to pay bribes. In the Attorney General's office, um, the way I think that, that corruption um, impacted that organization was there were – we estimated that given – numbers, again, are hard to come by in Afghanistan. But we estimated given the number of prosecutors and the number of cases, um, each prosecutor had about 14 cases at, at most a year to prosecute, which isn't that much. Um, cases are an opportunity to make money um, because – you can extract bribes from them. And so in the, in the Attorney General's office, cases tend to flow to people who are cronies of the leadership and um, to the detriment of, of prosecutors who um, are not well connected within the Attorney General's office. And um, in some parts of the Attorney General's office, you'll have two types of prosecutors. You'll have prosecutors that have a lot of cases and um, are getting money, and you've got the, the rest of the prosecutors who are uh, show up at work, sign in, don't do anything all day, you know, drink chai and, um, and, and eat, and then go home without having done any work that day. Brookings Institutions uh, it has an index of state weakness in the developing world. I think this was a result of 9-11 uh, and the recognition that weak states um, give us problems. Um, it's a, a tool for analyzing the world's most vulnerable countries, and um, the uh, index uh, assesses 141 developing countries um, according to their performance in four broad spheres, uh, economic, political, security, and uh, social welfare. They assign points, and, and these, if the four categories are broken down further. For example, economic, they look at GDP or inflation. Um, for political, they look at human rights. They look at the number of coups, things like that. Um, and then there's a basket score where all the scores are kind of compiled within the, the four spheres, and then those are compiled. Um, zero is the worst. Ten is the best. And you can see, if you well, some of you can probably see, that Afghanistan is um, at the bottom. There's only one state that's weaker than Afghanistan, according to this index, which is Somalia. Uh, the other 141 developing states are, are stronger than Afghanistan. Um, this is obviously due to um, yeah, all, all the topics I talked about, 30 years of, of war, malnutrition, lack of education, on and on. I wanted to show this slide because it gives you an idea. This, this is the state that we're trying to build a, a justice system on top of. It gives you an idea, I think, of the magnitude of, of the challenge of trying to build a formal justice system uh, with a country that ranks um, at this level. I mentioned the um, legal pluralism and, and the difference between the formal system and the informal system. I think this is going to be tough for people to see, but I wanted to include it. Um, Brookings did a survey of 6,200 Afghans, and they, they, pulled, they were polled in, in 2007, and they were asked um, where they would choose to take a number of different cases if they could. Um, for those of you who can't see, uh, the answers are the top one says dispute over land. 55% 50 of those Afghans said they would like to take those disputes to a state court or the formal justice system. 38% uh, said a shura or jirga, and 7% um, said some other community forum like an elder or a mullah or something like that. Other property disputes, so something less serious. 40% uh, said they'd like to take um, some kind of other property dispute to a state court. 
43% uh, said they'd like to take something like that to Ashura or Jirga, 17% to some other forum. Um, pickpocketing, 53% said they'd like to take it to the formal justice system, 30 to the informal. Physical assault was 50% uh, said they'd like to take it to the uh, formal justice system, 32% said informal. And then all the way at the bottom, there's murder. 82% said they would take that to the formal justice system, 12% to the informal, and 6% other. I'm not sure what the other would be in that case. Um, I think given my experience in Afghanistan, these numbers are a little high when it comes to the formal system. Um, there was um, – there's an Afghan um, human development index that I if, – if you're interested in, in rule of law in Afghanistan, I would highly recommend that you read. It was done um, by a think tank associated with Kabul University and, and by Afghans with some international assistance. They reckon that um, the numbers are more along the lines of an 80-20 split so that um, right now – and th these are hypothetical questions – what the ADHI um, – believed to be the case was that 20% of the cases in reality go to the formal justice system and 80% go to the informal justice system. Um, and that comports with my experience there and talking to people and being out to the regions um, and, and just living there for a year. Um, another number I've heard is 60% uh, go to informal and 40% to, to formal. So I think these numbers are a little high. I don't know how to explain that. I think it might be that they're hypothetical. So maybe people were saying, well, we would like to take these cases to the formal system, but in reality, a lot of these courts aren't there, so there's no place to take them. Sorry, sure. The source, um, this, this, uh, yeah. it's, it's not Brookings. Brookings compiled this data. Uh, this is from the Center for Policy and Human Development. It's an Afghan institution, and it's the Afghan Human Development Report, uh, 2007. Thanks. I, I just jumped in. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, uh, Brookings is doing a, a, a survey of internal displacement uh, in uh, Afghanistan. And one of the issues we're looking at is the justice needs of internally displaced persons. It's currently a number anywhere from 280,000 people on up. Uh, and I think that what we're hearing is, again, I think more people than not are, are looking towards the informal system. So I, I tend to think this, you know, 20% looking at the uh, formal and 80% looking uh, towards the informal is a little bit more uh, accurate. But Agreed. clearly on land disputes, uh, they're going informal, uh, and also on some family law uh, type issues they're going with the informal. I think it depends on where you are, too. Uh, a lot of people in the regions um, don't have access to the formal system. It, it, I don't know if any of you have flown over Afghanistan, but a lot of it looks like a, like a moonscape. Um, you'll have these vast tracts of, of barren land, and then there'll be an isolated little valley that's green, and there'll be a small little village there, and then you fly over that, and there's just nothing. Um, no goats, no, no trees, no nothing. And so the formal justice system doesn't reach in places like that. Um, you'll have police sometimes in those places, but no prosecutors and, and no judges. Um, I, think, I think this is helpful, though, to understand that um, the um, – the more serious the case is, like this murder, um, the more likely it is to end up in the formal system. It's hard to hide a murder, even in Afghanistan. And so the police are going to be on it and more likely not to want to cover it up. People are going to know about it. Uh, maybe the perpetrator can't bribe their way out um, because they're afraid of, of, of you know, hiding the case and then being caught for doing that. Um, so the more serious cases, I think, do end up in the, in the formal system just because they're harder to cover up. This one's a bit complicated. Again, I know it's, it's hard to see. Uh, the public perception of the two system, systems. This measures um, five statements, uh, positive statements, and um, people's correlation um, to, to whether they think that they're true or not. Um, so it says up top, percentage of people who strongly or somewhat agree with respect to various statements related to the state court and jurgas or shuras. And it has two years in which this was measured, 2007 and 2008. Um, the statement, they are accessible to me. Um, for the state court system, 78% of the people um, agreed with that. 68% didn't. They are fair and trusted. 58% agree in 2007. Or, or sorry, 50, yeah, 58% 50, agree in, in 2007. 50% of people agree in 2008. Um, it kind of goes on like that. Um, and I think, again, these numbers are a little high. 
um, in, in talking to, to Afghans, both just citizens and people that work in the justice system, I would think that these numbers would be a lot lower, both in two, 2007 and 2008, um, in relation to the formal system. But um, I think this is helpful because it shows um, – Two things. Number one, the numbers are consistently higher for the informal system. So the informal system is um, more accessible, uh, more fair and trusted, uh, follows local norms and values more, are effect is more effective and more timely than the informal system, according to this poll. And, and that does reflect what I saw in Afghanistan. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is that if you look at these columns, um, they go down, the numbers go down from 2007 to 2008, which also reflects what I saw. Um, the, uh, the patients in Afghanistan is wearing thin. Um, they, they're tired of promises. They're tired of being preyed upon by um, a formal justice system um, that extracts bribes and doesn't deliver a whole lot of justice. And so um, I agree with that trend, that downward trend. Uh, what I was a little surprised at was the downward trend in the uh, perceptions of jirgas and shuras uh, of the informal system. Um, you see in every category it's gone down from 2007 to, to 2008. And I think that that poses a, a problem uh, or at least an additional consideration um, as we talk about whether linking the formal system and the informal system is going to bring beneficial results. Um, the... Um, by the time I actually, about September, I started hearing this from the U.S. Embassy about linking these two systems, how could we do it? And the idea is that, again, the uh, formal system will bring a level of oversight to the informal system to ensure that human rights abuses don't continue in the informal system. Um, the informal system, um, in theory, will bring reach and accessibility to the formal system uh, as well as some of these uh, uh, positive values here. But um, the flip side is I think Afghans are tiring of all their institutions. They're getting tired of us internationals uh, not being able to, to implement reform. They're getting tired of their formal court system. And if you believe this, and I think this is accurate, they're getting tired of their informal justice system too. So um, if we do move forward and, and link these two systems, and I think that's the, the direction that people are headed over there, um, we need to take this into account, too, that the credibility of the informal system is, is also being questioned and maybe eroding. Uh, the other is that article of the Constitution I mentioned earlier, I think Article 27, that says that um, no one may be punished in Afghanistan um, unless it's through an authoritative court and in accordance with laws that have been promulgated uh, prior to the act being committed. Um, I think we'd need to take, take into account that as well before um, linking these two systems. And it may be as easy as um, just passing some legislation that would recognize the, the shuras and jirgas as authoritative courts and uh, some kind of um, – and saying that they're, uh, they can implement the formal laws of Afghanistan. Uh, that, that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, Obviously, we've got big problems there, and um, 30 years of war with Taliban rule wiped out a, a generation of jurists and people that I think we could have relied on and attached to um, to help us rebuild some of these justice institutions. They're, they're few and far between right now. Um, there are a lot of returning refugees, and so we're making use of them. The present attorney general, we, we got through a lot of uh, – we pushed through a lot of these reforms like the anti-corruption unit and the case management system because of the present attorney general, Mr. Alico. Um, he's a returning refugee. He was in Germany for a number of years working for the German Ministry of Justice, and so he is uh, reform-minded. Um, so – there is some hope. Um, my sense is in, some, in most parts of the country it's not too late. Um, if you're talking about Helmand or something like that, um, I think they've probably given up on us. Um, but I think in Kabul and, and other city centers, there still may be enough goodwill left where if, if we get on it right now, we might be able um, to make some, enough progress um, to keep um, Afghanistan on our side in, in the fight against the Taliban. Um, as I said, statistics are difficult um, to obtain, so it's hard to measure progress. But um, we know that, um, that the formal system is still broken. 
A majority of the cases um, are either not passed on to the, um, from the police who detect them to the prosecutors. Um, and that minority of cases that are passed on are, are often uh, weeded out uh, through corruption and bribery or incompetence. Um, people that do end up at the tail end of the justice system and end up in Pulacharki prison are the ones that are poor. Uh, they're the weakest in society. They can't pay bribes. They can't even get out of prison. They're, they're, we found people there um, years past um, the, the release date. Um, and so it's a big problem, but I think we've, uh, um, we, there, there still is time to, uh, to try to fix it. And with that... I, I, thanks, Rob. Uh, I thought that was uh, very informative, uh, uh, a nice perspective from uh, the field uh, with a focus on the, the technical uh, side of things. As you said, you're in the weeds. You're implementing uh, uh, strategies and policies. Um, and you ended on an optimistic note, which is always a good thing. Um, but I'm just wondering if we, I could pull you out of the weeds for a moment and, and talk a little bit about strategies and, and policies. Uh, one of the recognized best practices uh, in rule of law promotion, rule of law projects, interventions, whatever you want to call them, is something I alluded to earlier, and that's just you know, having clear and realistic uh, objectives uh, going in and then the strategies to um, uh, realize uh, these goals. So. You know, again, could you just summarize a little bit, to what extent are there uh, strategies at the national level uh, on rule of laws, just in the justice sector? How are they being developed? Who's driving this rule of law agenda um, in terms of you know, international versus national? What is the coordination? Are there task forces on that? And then finally, um, there seems, you, you talked about legal pluralism. There's also, I guess, organizational pluralism, including the military. That's there. So how does the civilian military coordination or interaction play out in terms of rule of law? Okay. Um, in terms of um, international uh, strategies and cooperation, they kind of started, I think, um, post-invasion with the, uh, the Bonn Agreement of 2001. The, the, the Bonn Agreement um, set up, uh, provided for a, a way to develop a constitution. It provided for an interim Afghan administration and for elections in 2004. Um, it also um, set up um, a strategy um, for uh, to, to develop rule of law. I think it was partially successful. We um, had elections in 2004 that I think were relatively fair. Um, people turned out. I think it, it met expectations of the international community. Uh, also, we have a pretty good constitution that, that came out of that. Um, however, um, the, probably in terms of developing a rule of law past that, it, it was a failure. Um, the uh, lead nation concept, I think, came out of Bonn. And the lead nation concept, probably most of you know, is uh, that, that idea was that certain nations would pick certain topics and devote their resources to that. So Italy was supposed to do, develop the justice system in Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. was responsible for security, U.K. for drug interdic interdiction, um, on and on. Um, that didn't work very well. Uh, my understanding of what happened is that um, you had people, you had countries um, giving different levels of resources to, to address the problems, and there were a lot of, through, through varying mechanisms, and so there were a lot of kind of under-resourced organizations running around in Afghanistan um, overlapping and, and competing with each other. Uh, then uh, the Afghan National Development Strategy came out in 2005. It had broad development goals, including uh, uh, working on the developing the economy, um, the political scene, uh, rule of law. And uh, that was linked with the uh, London Conference in 2006. Um, I think the, the lead nation concept was scrapped then. And... Um, we, uh, we, the, the London conference ended up with, it was basically a, uh, resulted in a political agreement between Afghanistan and the international community about how to implement the Afghan national development strategy, including rule of law. Um, and then in 2007, probably for justice purposes, there was the Rome conference that was, it was held in Rome in July of 2007. And um, all the uh, justice sector institutions came to Rome in July 
of 2007 with development strategies. And those were synthesized into the national justice sector strategy. So that's the uh, strategy that Afghanistan and internationals agree is going to be used to, to develop rule of law in Afghanistan. And it's going to be implemented through the national justice program, the NJP. Um, it's backed up by the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund that World Bank is in charge of administering. I alluded to that earlier. Um, it's a fund of money that um, Afghan rule of law institutions can go to to implement reforms. But as I discussed, there are all kinds of problems there. So in broadly speaking, uh, strategy writ large, um, we've tried some things um, with limited success, uh, met with some success, met with some failures, um, and then in 2007 kind of came out with this national justice sector strategy. In terms of, like you said, I was in the weeds. For me, um, the national justice sector strategy was interesting, but it didn't govern my work. Um, I reported to, um, to the, my management in JSSP, who reported to PAE, who reported to INL. And um, my strategy was a work plan. It was uh, the scope of work that we had under our contract. Um, also at the implementer level, well, maybe back up, I never saw a, a U.S. Uh, strategy. Um, that would have linked our efforts or USAID's efforts or uh, U.S. military's efforts in developing rule of law to that national justice sector strategy that I talked about. Um, there was a rule of law coordinator um, in Afghanistan. Uh, however, I don't think he was empowered to um, do what needed to be done to get us to coordinate. As a result, we were pretty stovepiped. Um, we, USAID went off and did their thing with judges. We did our thing with, with prosecutors and defense attorneys and never the twain shall meet. When there was coordination at my level, um, it was because we, the implementers, did it. Um, I've been around rule of law for about seven years, and um, so I, I knew some people from the Balkans who were working in, in the UN or with UPOL. And based on those personal relationships, we'd invite these guys over and say, hey, let's, let's all get together and let's implement so that let's, let's get in, set up an anti-corruption unit within the uh, attorney general's office. And so um, authority kind of devolved down to the level of people like me to, to do the coordination. I'll defer my a commentator role and just do more facilitation uh, in order to get some back and forth going. So maybe we, we should open it up to the audience. And we start with Milan. Um. Milan Civic, uh, role model advisor and investment in the Office of the Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization State Department. Uh, you mentioned a number of times the um, elite anti-corruption unit. I'm wondering if that unit addresses corruption among the uh, justice sector, um, among the judges. Yes, it should. Um, it, it, it should have, and, and um, I say should because it's, a ba it's embryonic right now. Um, they've probably done, um, well, they probably have in, in their hopper right now maybe 10 cases. They just started. Um, but the idea is they have all the power that um, any prosecutor would have. And as you saw from my presentation, the Attorney General has a lot of power. So, Yes. You bet we'll get that argument. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we just go back towards the end and then come up the front. So this gentleman in uniform. Hi, I'm Martin Hindle. I'm a JAG uh, assigned to the Military Commission Office uh, and working at Guantanamo Bay. And I think at last count there are roughly 24 Afghans, some of whom may be seeking repatriation to their country. Um, I realize you were working in the weeds, but I do want to ask anyway, are you aware of is there any impact of what we learned here in your presentation that the state of affairs of the Ministry of Justice, the Corrections Department over there, is that in, has that in any way had any influence on the deliberations of the administration here in deciding whether and how to send people back to Afghanistan? I don't know. That's a really good question. One of the last things I did before I left was uh, brief um, uh, General Stone, um, who came out with um, his rule of law team. He was really interested in two things, um, cops and, and corrections. And um, I think with an eye towards um, dealing with the issue that you're discussing. Um, I didn't ask, he didn't say, but we spent um, two hours talking to him. And what I took away from that was 
They're very interested in ensuring that we've got a kind of a fair and transparent and reliable correction system to deal with people like you're talking about. But I'll tell you, all the time at Policherki Prison, the prison I mentioned, um, we, people are dumped there by the NDS, the, the National um, Security Directorate. And um, these are people that are pulled off a of battle space. Uh, they've attacked coalition troops or ISAF. Um, and they're, they're, they find their way from the provinces to NDS um, in the capital, and they have no paper associated with them. And then they're just dumped off at Poli. So in Poli, Turkey, there's a certain block, I think it's Block D, where you've got all those prisoners, and, and we're, we weren't allowed to go there. Um, I, I'd be surprised if you had much documentation of people there, and I'm not sure what processes they're using to monitor those people. Okay, just moving back. We'll get up to the front. Anybody? Let's, sir. Yeah, it's happening. It's a good question. Um, first of all, I have uh, so much respect for the military over there. Um, not only are they fighting the war, uh, but now they're, they're having to step in to do rule of law stuff too. Um, I had pretty good experiences with the military. Um, I'll, I'll mention a name, Major McGovern from CJTF 101 um, in RC East. Uh, he was great to work with. And in fact, the only coordinating conference that I ever went to for, for the U.S. side was put on by CJTF 101 and Major McGovern. He brought um, civilian and military um, at Bagram. Um, this was just like a month and a half ago. And we all, for the first time, got to get up and say, hey, here's what we're doing. And you probably know how valuable that is. Somebody hears, wait a minute, you're working with prisons. We're working with prisons. Why don't we work together? Uh, and I'd been there a year. Um, and so my hat's off to the military. Um, I, I, I did get crosswise with, with a couple of guys in the military, but uh, I guess that's to be expected. Um, my take on it is um, probably the civilian side. We civilians aren't, aren't pulling our weight, and so the military is, is stepping in and starting to do so. Um, they've, you know, they're at the, the uh, PRTs. Um, the PRT effort, in my opinion, is not very well coordinated. It depends on the individual commander out on the PRT regarding how much effort they put into rule of law and uh, what kind of projects they do. They've got the SURF uh, funds, um, and that's really helpful. They can make The military can make money move in a way we never could. Um, and so if I could do it over again, if I, if I went back and did another year, I would – connect up with you guys and see if uh, we couldn't work even more closely together. The, the downside was um, I saw that the military building things that the Afghans didn't want. And um, there were a lot of state-of-the-art um, justice centers that um, had way more um, bells and whistles than was needed in Afghanistan. But we should have been working closer together, and we, we could have helped out in that regard. Moving to the rear. Uh, gentlemen standing up, yellow tie. Year. And um, I also re just returned from Afghanistan a few weeks ago, and, and uh, we had an interview with the Attorney General um, Alakov. And um, one of the things that seems to be a consistent theme from the um, Block D trials that, that we saw and conversations with, um, with the Attorney General is a certain frustration uh, on the part of the Afghan authorities with the level of cooperation they're getting um, from the U.S. side on questions of, of developing evidence, um, being willing to uh, appear as witnesses or, or even just uh, provide affidavits uh, for judicial proceedings uh, in connection with, uh, in particular, with persons who are transferred from U.S. Bagram custody into Afghan custody. Um, Attorney General Alakal told us that despite um, several levels of individuals after they've been acquitted in the Afghan justice system, um, these individuals still are not released, and then the, the decision finally comes to him. And um, he made the interesting comment that, well, um, I have the power to release individuals, but um, the Americans must have given us these people for a reason. Um, and then he also managed to say, plus I heard on CNN the other day that 
Um, the Taliban were just 60 kilometers from, uh, from Islamabad, so I'm not going to order anybody released when the Taliban are 60 kilometers from um, Islamabad, which I think cons confirms some of what you were saying about um, the lack of consciousness about what constitutes rule of law. Um, but, I, but I do think, and we also got a very strong sense, that um, the ability of the Afghans to implement rule of law reforms would be assisted greatly if the um, U.S. authorities were more, th more forthcoming, not so much in terms of uh, the capacity building issues, which everybody talks about, but um, just the, the mere cooperation with Afghan authorities in the execution of existing um, opportunities to, to implement criminal justice, and I'd like your reaction to that. Because we didn't work in, in Block D, um, you know, we did a lot of work in, in the prisons, but we, we didn't go there. Um, I probably don't have much of a comment on that, just not because I'm being coy or anything, just because um, I didn't brush up against that issue and, and, and dig down into it. Um, however, uh, everything that you're saying sounds very familiar to me. Informative intervention, so thank you. Uh, let's just work up this side. Um, Dan Schneider. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Schneider from American University. Hey, how are you? Um, you've amply demonstrated the lack of the problem with the lack of capacity, uh, specifically when it comes to uh, anti-corruption efforts. I wonder if you'd comment a little bit on the presence or absence of political will, though, at the highest government levels to address corruption. Are, are you talking about um, U.S. or international no, or in, Afghan? In, in I'm going to, I've been speaking in broad generalizations all day, so I'll just kind of continue. I, I think, very generally speaking, um, a lot of Afghans at the top um, know that they're going to be there a very short time, um, know that this is their chance to probably make some money, and so um, they often run their ministries in a way that ensures that they, they get money and, and that they're provided for after, after they leave. <laughs> And so, um, no, there's, there's not a lot of political will at the top of the Afghan government to deal with corruption because, um, you know, many of the people at the top are complicit in it. And I'm not saying Karzai. I don't think he is. I've, I've not heard that he is. But um, he's got an election coming up. August, August 20 is fast approaching. And um, he's got a constituency, and he wants to keep those people happy. And so he is subject to pressure. What I haven't seen a lot of is countervailing uh, pressure from the international community saying, um, you, you've got to do something about this. You've got to start appointing um, honest managers at the top of your ministries and, um, and rooting out corruption. And, yes, it does deal with capacity. Yes, please. I, exactly. The, um, the ACU, 15 prosecutors, it's, it's not going to stop prosecution or, or corruption in Afghanistan. Um, what will help is what we talked about with Dan, um, you know, trying to change the leadership at, at the ministries um, so to ensure that there is political will to root out corruption. And this PRR process that I talked a little bit about, it's kind of a complex process, but the idea is the institution reforms, higher salaries result 
and therefore there's less of an incentive to, um, to take bribes. Um, the higher salaries, however, that, I'm, that we're talking about here with PRR is going from $87 to $200 in the first stage. So um, if, um, if $300 is subsistence level in Kabul, we're still not there yet. The next step with PRR, and when we started down this road, we reformed the um, Human Resources Office in the, in the AGO, in the Attorney General's Office, and then um, we actually we're just about finished with that. Once that's reformed, then we'll partner with them and uh, with the Civil Service Commission of, of Afghanistan to reform the rest of the Attorney General's office. But that's going to take time. Um, I don't think we're going to see a change um, probably. Th it's going to happen incrementally. So, for example, Human Resources Office in the AGO is the first to be reformed under PRR. Their salaries go from an average of $87 up to $200. Then we go on to investigations division. We reform that. That's going to take five months. Um, when that's done and, and people um, are rehired for jobs or hired for jobs and that um, arm of the Attorney General's office is reformed, then their salaries go up from 80, an average of 87 to 200. And then we go to the next one and the next one. So it's going to take a long time. The next step is uh, pay and grading reform, um, where we start to um, institutionalize these increases and get budget line items in the state budget. They'll go up a little bit more, but we're still not talking probably enough to really address the, the corruption problem. So um, it's going to take um, – a multi-pronged effort to, to deal with this. It's going to take political will. It's going to take an increase in salaries even beyond what we're, we were trying to do with PRR. It's going to take um, corruptions through the anti-corruption unit and expansion of that unit. And if everything else, all of you people, we all could probably come up with. It's, it's going to be tough. Okay. Uh, just moving back, anyone on this side? Okay, well, I think well then we'll loop around. Uh, standing up gives you an advantage. So... Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Timothy Katsis. I just returned from uh, 18 months in Iraq as rule of law advisor for Basra PRT. And uh, you made a comment about, you know, uh, the declining uh, trust in the, the justice system among Afghans. And you said we need to do something soon, especially in Kabul, in order to, to regain their trust. And I know from Iraq about, you know, leading the horse to the water, dragging the horse to the water, throwing him in the water. <clears throat> and this gentleman uh, talked about a lack of political will on the part of the host nation. Uh, if you know what, what are we to do? And you talked. You also mentioned a lack of uh, a lack of coordination, a lack of strategy. If you had five years and the resources you need, what would you do from now? That's a tough question. Um, I. It, it, I guess if I had a magic wand and I, I could wave it, um, what I would do would, would ensure that there was – the U.S. had a strategy for, for dealing with rule of law because I think our efforts right now are pretty fragmented um, so that we would have a coherent path forward that would, would unite all our efforts. Um, I would um, ensure that um, we had – that that would include political pressure – uh, on the highest levels of the Afghan government to do just what we talked about, um, to appoint um, good managers as ministers of the government who would then um, have the backing of the international community and, and the government of Afghanistan at the highest levels to root out corruption. I would support the High Office of Oversight, uh, which is a brand new anti-corruption organization. It's got a bit of an ambiguous mandate. Um, it's, it's a little too broad. It talks about the High Office of Oversight overseeing all the anti-corruption um, efforts in Afghanistan as they relate to all the ministries. Um, I met with Ershad, who's, who's the director of, of the HOO, um, and he seems to be one of these ideal managers. Um, young, good, smart, um, understands, get, gets the problem and, and wants to address it. And so I would empower that organization as well. Um, and um, I would raise salaries like we talked about so people don't have an excuse to, uh, to take bribes. I would ram through the case management system, uh, both the paper-based system and the electronic system, to ensure that uh, people can't make cases go away. I probably would link the formal and the informal justice systems um, and try to capitalize on strengths and minimize uh, weaknesses. Um, I would also um, unify the efforts out of the PRTs. 
um, so that the efforts out there didn't depend on the willingness of the individual commanders to get things done, um, but that everybody kind of had a plan and, and was going about it. Um, and uh, I would – I think we need more civilian advisors out there. Um, we talked about the military. I think the military is pulling their weight. I, I don't know about us civilians. I don't know that we're, we're doing enough. Um, I would ensure that the people that we send over there – um, are of the highest caliber, that they've done development work before, they understand the issues. Right now we're not getting that in Afghanistan. You've got sort of a thin layer of people who have done this work before and understand how it's done, um, but maybe um, maybe even a majority of people that, may, that didn't have a passport before they left to take this job. Um, so try to recruit the, the, the best and the brightest. Something's already being done. Um, the new ambassador, Eikenberry, has, I, I heard at first three, then five, and now something like seven, maybe, deputy ambassadors um, who are in charge with, with doing different spe specific things. And I think that's actually a step in the right direction. Um, and uh, the fact that at the Bagram con conference that CJTF um, 101 put on uh, a month and a half ago, one of those deputy ambassadors showed up. Um, I take as a, as a really good sign. So those are just a few things. Okay. Uh, right here, please. This is where I have to go back to my caveat. Um, I, I, I don't consider myself in any way an expert on the informal system. Um, I did work with a guy, a British guy, um, who went down to Helmand in Lashkarga and worked on this issue. And what he did was, if I understand him correctly, um, Afghanistan politically is divided. You, you've got the central government in Kabul, and then you've got 34 provinces. So you've got a provincial government, and then those provinces are broken down further into districts. He worked with the, um, uh, the district-level authorities, uh, political authorities, and linked them with the jurgas and shuras. And um, the way – and I, I didn't get down there to see whether it really worked or not, but um, as I understand it, the way it worked was uh, if ANP would bring in people um, into the detention center, there would be a shura made up of the uh, ANP – um, CPD, Central Prison Directorate, uh, an international to oversee things, um, uh, somebody, uh, a member of the um, district council, and, and um, I think maybe a member of the attorney general's office. They would review uh, the evidence on the person who was apprehended and in detention to see whether there was evidence. If there wasn't, the person was released. And that's going to solve a lot of problems right there because a lot of people are in detention with no evidence. Um, if, um, if there is evidence, then a determination was made by the shura whether it was a serious crime or not. And one of the problems that I saw that they had was they had no clear-cut definition of what a serious crime was. So is a sex assault serious? Maybe. Murder probably would be. Um, if there was evidence and it was a serious crime, it was sent to Lashkar Gah and dealt with through the formal system. If it was considered not serious, it was sent – to um, the, the uh, shura or jirga um, that was sanctioned by the, the district government to deal with the case. And I know there was a, a judge down there before he was assassinated who would um, hear that the, the, the shura or jirga would come in with the results that they came up with in the verdict, and then this judge would say yes, you know, and, and kind of formalize that verdict and adopt it as his own. But like I said, then he was, he was assassinated. Uh, I'm not sure if they're continuing to do that. But that could be one model of, of how you could do it. Just, uh, it. It sounds like the formal system is willing to uh, work with the, the justice, and, and it recognizes that there can be some interplay with the informal justice system. Uh, is the informal uh, justice, and then this might be case by case, but do you have any sense whether informal mechanisms are, you know, are willing to uh, be regulated by or, or, or formalize this interplay with the um, with the formal, uh, and how do you incentivize that? Yeah. 
The uh, Afghan Human Development Index that I mentioned earlier um, addressed this question. And what they found, they, they did some polling. I think UNIFEM went out and, um, and talked to some elders and, and people that are members of, uh, of Shiraz and Jirgas. And um, according to that study, um, these people were receptive to, um, to getting more support from the formal system, whether it meant linking in, in this way um, or even just on the other end, um, just more training on human rights and things like that. Um, and I, I, I wish I could remember now. I, I read this a couple of months ago. Uh, I don't think it was unanimous, but I think it was, it was um, a pretty popular idea among the people that UNIFEM talked to. Here. Yes, uh, well, thank you for that fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm trying to get a feel for the coordination of this. Does the Legal Advisors Office at State lead all of this? Or let's say that you were advising a young person who wanted to get a job, as you had. Where, where would they go to apply? And how much might, might they expect to get paid? And uh, <laughs> what uh, you suggest more civilians, but would they be contractors with the DOD or contractors with the legal advisors office, or who's running all of this? I, I can give you, I can tell you how, what my experience was. Um, I was contacted by the chief of team of, of JSSP, who was in Afghanistan, um, and he's an Iranian American. Um, and um, he was working with state INL to try to bring people out that had development experience to come to Kabul and to take some key positions. And um, they offer a very – because this is a contractor, um, you get a base salary, plus you get a post differential on top of that, which is 35 percent of your base, plus you get a danger pay because you're in a conflict zone of 35 percent on top of that. And so um, it, it pays very well, um, as, as a lot of these contractor jobs do. Uh, it was – recruiting was done mostly through the contractor, through PAE, um, although INL was involved in – we had to do a psych test. Um, we had to do oral boards. We had to do a, a pass a medical test. Um, and so State Department was very involved in that process of weeding out and, 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 and training. Um, and the way to, uh, to find out how to do all this – is to go on to a website like DevX or, or something like that. These jobs are posted all the time, and um, probably people here know the, the web addresses for those better than I do. Um, and so it's, it's done – most of this is done through contractors from, from State Department. Uh, DOJ was there, and they, they worked in their capacity as um, assistant attorneys. Uh, USAID was there, but they were operating through a contract uh, through Checky. Um, and so this is actually fairly typical of other countries I've been in, um, how this assistance is delivered and coordinated. Okay, we're, uh, let's just do three more. Uh, we'll just use this row, you, uh, you, and you. <laughs> you mentioned the PRTs and the increased civilian presence over there. Any, any, do you have any comments that would focus on um, the role and the increasing role in the future of uh, rule of law and governance advisors on the PRTs? I don't have much more to say on that just because I didn't spend a lot of time out there. I was on a German PRT up in Kunduz um, and uh, spent a lot of time there. Um, what I, I, I guess I can comment based on my experience there. They didn't go out much. And um, the PJCM um, was, uh, was there. The um, – the, the, the Provincial Justice Coordinating uh, Mechanism um, that, that got set up through um, the strategy I was talking about earlier, um, NJSS. Um, and so up in Kunduz, um, we're, we're on a, a German PRT. Uh, there was a State Department rule of law – or State Department um, employee who was embedded in the German PRT. And um, – Nobody in the PRT had held any coordinating meetings uh, for rule of law work done in Kunduz. And so um, I was there just by luck um, at the first meeting where the U.S. State Department guy said, hey, we need to get people together uh, to start talking about what we're doing in Kunduz regarding rule of law. And uh, UNAMA came um, because they've got that, that coordinating role. 
Um, and it was a pretty lightweight meeting. Um, people really hadn't done much. GTZ was there because it was, it was a German um, PRT. They were looking at getting some minor funds and, um, like, what are they going to do? They're going to buy desks and chairs or something for um, uh, prosecutor's office. Uh, we were there. GSSP was there because we had an RTC um, about uh, 300 meters from the, the PRT where we were training um, prosecutors and CID police officers. And so we were actually doing the most in, in Kunduz um, regarding rule of law reform. Um, so that's, but that's just a limited, it's not American um, PRT, so that's my limited exposure. But I would say, at least in Kunduz, do more. That's, that's really good to hear. Um, I, 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 I've heard about this, and but I was so far away, I, I wasn't following the development. So um, I, I wish that effort success. No, it's it's uh, um, it, it, it corresponds to what I experienced when I was there. Um, I think that they, you're right that, that Afghans that say that they like the informal system like it because it's what they're used to. Um, it's based on their traditions, and um, it's not as corrupt. Although I, it's interesting, these numbers that show um, declining confidence in it. It's also faster. And it's accessible. And it's done by people that they know, um, not, not somebody from Kabul, not somebody from Lashkar Ghat, but somebody that's, that's close by. Um, the community endorses it. Um, usually the sanctions are, are endorsed by the community, and so it brings uh, cohesion. Um, so those are, the, those are the, the, the good parts. The bad parts um, are um, you know, the human rights violations that take place, regarding, especially regarding women. And just what you talked about, GDP in Afghanistan, I guess, is, is actually growing, and um, that's a good sign. And um, but, but with affluence probably comes mobility. And so just like you said, if you're a Tajik, um, but you go down to um, Kandahar or something and you commit a crime there, you're probably not going to want to go through the informal system. And so um, I think that's a big drawback to it. And... Um, I think, however, that's something that might be addressed if you, if you link the two and maybe bring some standardization. Okay. Well, um, uh, that brings our, our program to an end then, and I'd like just to thank you again for coming and thank Rob and Andrew for those um, very interesting remarks. Uh, we here in Washington, I think, often have the bird's eye view or think we have the bird's eye view. Um, and it's incredibly helpful um, to get down in the weeds and get the insights um, that you have, Rob, into an issue that's of enormous importance to us. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, those of you who are not members of the society, I want to encourage you to join the society. We're open to all lawyers and non-lawyers, Americans and non-Americans, notwithstanding our name is the American Society of International Law, and there are materials on your chairs about uh, joining the society. I also want to alert you to some upcoming events here. 
Um, I don't think we have a lot of students or young professionals in the room, but we do have a summer associate um, series that um, we carry out during the summer to familiarize young lawyers, aspiring lawyers, and um, in, about the practice of international law. The first of those will be a reception on June 30th here in the evening, and all this information is on our website. So if you're supervising interns or summer associates, encourage them to come and, um, to that event. On um, the, the first uh, week or so of July, our Women in International Law Interest Group has two events that would be of interest to a number of you, I'm sure. The first um, will be on July 2nd, and that will be a briefing um, by Ambassador Milan Verveer, who's the new ambassador at large for global women's issues, and Ambassador Luis DeBaca, who's the director of the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. They will be discussing gender issues, international law, and the new administration, laying out the Obama administration's agenda and those issues. And then the Willig Women in International Law Interest Group will have a networking breakfast on uh, July 9th. So, um, if you're members of the society, uh, watch your email for announcements of the, about those or check our website. And uh, th uh, uh, thank you for coming and join me in thanking Rob and uh, Andrew as well. <laughs>